Life in the Trinity Ministry, in partnership with Brian McLaren, is pleased to present this series entitled, The Storyline of the Bible. We're working our way through the biblical narrative in seven episodes. Uh, episode one was creation, followed by crisis, followed by calling, conversation, Christ. And then we come to the sixth episode, uh, which is the episode we're part of today. Uh, really, we're part of all the episodes in various ways today, but, but we're the church, the commissioned community of followers of Christ. And um, I'd like to begin with a prayer uh, today that uh, I think you'll find a very moving and beautiful prayer, and it introduces the subject uh, of today's podcast. Here's the prayer. You are my breath my hope, my companion, my craving, my abundant wealth. Without you, my life, my love, I would never have wandered across these endless countries. I look everywhere for your love. Then I am suddenly filled with it. O oh, captain of my heart, radiant eye of yearning in my breast, I will never be free from you as long as I live. Be satisfied with me, love, and I am satisfied. Very, very powerful prayer, I'm sure you'll agree. And if I were to ask you where that prayer is from, some of you who are knowledgeable about church history might say, well, it sounds like Bernard of Clairvaux. Or maybe you'd say, no, it sounds like Teresa of Avila. But this actually comes from a... uh, uh, an unlikely source uh, for many of us. It comes from a woman. Her name was Rabia of Basra, and uh, she is a Muslim, uh, highly revered in the Sufi community of Islam. She lived in the 8th century. And it might surprise you to hear such a, a fervent, a passionate prayer that sounds so much like Christian prayers and uh, uh, but but I wanted to read that prayer because it, it brings up our subject for today's podcast, which is how do we as Christians relate to members of other religions? Uh, I'd like to suggest to you uh, four ways that we have commonly related in the past, and uh, I'd like to reject three of those ways, and uh, then I'd like to add a fifth. Um uh, the, the first way that Christians relate to members of other religions is by converting them, by inviting them to switch sides and stop being Muslim or Hindu or Jewish or atheist or uh, animist and instead become followers of Christ. Uh, and uh, uh, be, my one of my main spiritual gifts is evangelism, and I love to help people who are interested and and who are searching for God, I love to invite them to follow the way of Christ and become disciples of Christ. Uh, To me, this is what evangelism is about. It's good news that God loves and accepts everyone. And if someone's part of a religion and their, their heart is unsatisfied and they aren't convinced of the truth of their faith... I want to spread, to open the door wide for them, uh, to learn the way of Christ and find life and peace and forgiveness and hope and purpose, uh, through Jesus Christ. Uh, and, uh, so that's one way that Christians relate to members of other religions by inviting them, uh, to convert by helping them in that process. But what happens when people don't want to convert? Well, then we come to a second common option, and that's the option of condemning people uh, or excluding people. Uh, going out of our way every chance we get to say how much we disapprove of people being a member of any religion other than ours. Uh, constantly trying to let them know that we consider them outsiders, that we consider them uh, unacceptable by God. And uh, we might say that we're trying to help them and love them, uh, but uh, I don't think it's a very pleasant experience for others to feel constantly excluded by us and identified as the other and the outsider uh, by us. I had a fascinating experience with this a couple of years ago. I was involved in a lot of uh, uh, Muslim-Christian relations work right after September 11th. And once at a local mosque, we had a meeting where we invited leaders from different religious traditions to come together. And it was, I think, a very productive meeting because at each of these gatherings, we would give a question and each person would answer the question according to his or her religious tradition. 
Uh, and one of our gatherings, the question was, what is my duty toward my neighbor based on my religion? And so a Muslim shared and a Sikh shared and a Hindu and a Buddhist. And there were several Christian representatives, a Catholic representative. Uh, I was a kind of a, a Protestant representative. There was a, a good friend of mine who's Pentecostal there. And, you know, God bless him. He he was as sincere as the day is long, and he got up there. We, by the way, we were supposed to speak for five minutes, and I think he went on for at least 20. Uh, but he was so passionate and so loud and so energetic that uh, nobody could interrupt him to, to let him know that his time was up. But his basic answer to the question, uh, I'll, I'll just tell you my answer was, uh, how, what's my duty to my neighbor according to my religion? It's to love my neighbor as I love myself. I, I, and I quoted Jesus and talked about what that means and told the story of Jesus and the Good Samaritan that for Jesus, my I have a special obligation and calling to love my neighbor who's different from me racially, uh, religiously, socioeconomically, and so on, uh, that, that I'm commanded to love my enemies. Uh, and so that, and certainly I'm called to love my neighbors of other religions. So that was my point. Well, my, my Pentecostal friend got up and he said, I'm telling you this because I love you. My duty to my neighbor uh, as a Christian is to tell you that you're going to hell. You're going to hell and you're going to burn in hell forever unless you repent and accept Jesus. Well, the, as he got going, he was speaking so loud and so fast and with so much emotion. At one point, he started to cry and it was so intense that most of the people gathered who were Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, they couldn't understand what he was saying. He was talking so fast, but they felt his emotion and they felt his love. And he got an ovation when he was finished. And I just thought this is a classic case of what a strange world we live in. But uh, uh, often it doesn't go that well when we take the second option to condemn people, to exclude them. Uh, I once was on a ferry boat uh, in, the, uh, in Puget Sound started talking with a fellow uh, on the ferry, uh, and uh, I asked him what he did for a living. He was a business owner. He asked me. I told him I was a pastor and an author. Uh, and he said, oh, he said, I'm a Jew. He said, I grew up the, in the only Jewish family in an entirely Christian uh, town in uh, Iowa. He says, as you can imagine, I don't have much respect for Christians. He said, every moment as a child, I felt like an outsider. I never felt accepted. I never had a friend. I was always marked as the Jew in my entire upbringing. Uh, and, and that's what it feels like when you're on the, in the second category. First, you try to, you, uh, Christians can try to convert people of other religions. Second, they can, can condemn and exclude them. Third option is to just downright persecute them, uh, and, and even execute them. And uh, I wish that we could realize how much more common this is in Christian history uh, than, than many of us realize. Uh, people of other religions know these stories a lot more than we Christians do. But let me just give you an example. In uh, 1857, uh, there was a, a deputy commissioner uh, from a British, uh, a British citizen. His name was Frederick Cooper. And uh, he... Uh, sent this report uh, back home to uh, the Foreign Office in London in 1857. He, he talked about how a group of Muslims, uh, 400 of them, escaped from a prison camp and how uh, they were then chased down and 150 of them were shot or, or pushed into the river and drowned. And um, about uh, the, the remaining uh, uh, Muslims... Uh, made it to the other side of the river, but they were then captured, and there were about 282 of them left. Um, now, th they were held, so these are 282 Muslims. We would say that they were fighting for liberation from being occupied and colonized by the British. Um, the Sikhs, um, some Sikhs, members of another religion, joined with the Christians uh, to kill all 282 of these what we would call prisoners of war. This is before the days of the Geneva Conventions uh, being followed, and uh, uh, or maybe Geneva Conventions not being followed, but that's another whole story. And um, uh, the, the Sikhs and the Christians then got together and said, okay, we're going to kill these 282 Muslims. Uh, the problem was, where are we going to put their bodies? He said, 
Uh, I'm quoting from his letter. There remained one last difficulty, which was of sanitary consideration. But again, as fortune would have it, a deep dry well was discovered within 100 yards of the police station, furnishing a convenient solution as to how to dispose of the dishonored soldiers. I, I don't know if you hear that language. Uh, sanitary, convenient solution. It's a little haunting because it's similar language to the uh, uh, the language of ethnic cleansing and uh, the language of the Nazis. It's uh, it's horrible. Uh, and uh, so then they they tell they they lead the these Muslim prisoners of war to believe that they're going to be brought out in groups of ten so that their grievances can be heard and they can be put on trial. Uh, but what happens is they bring the first group of ten out and then ten shots ring out and they're all killed well then the others who are being held in a, a room uh you know they become afraid and they bring groups of 10 out and shoot them when they get to the last uh group they realize that uh the, these men have been left in a hot building and they've uh in trying to escape uh over some number about 40 of them had been uh had been uh suffocated by uh, by the heat of this closed room and by their attempts to escape. Um, and uh, it's just this horrible massacre. Um, uh, it, here's how he ends his report. Uh, these dead, meaning the ones who died from suffocation, exhaustion, and fatigue, uh, along with their executed comrades, were thrown by the village sweepers into the well. Thus, within 48 hours of their escape, the entire 26th Regiment was accounted for and disposed of. Now listen to how he finishes his report. To those of you fond of reading signs, we would point to the solitary golden cross still gleaming aloft on the summit of the Christian church in Delhi, whole and untouched. Though the ball on which it rests is riddled with shots deliberately fired by the mutinous infidels of the town. The cross symbolically triumphant over a shattered globe. How the wisdom and heroism of our English soldiers seem like mere dross before the manifest and wonderful interposition of Almighty God in the cause of Christianity. And if you catch what he's saying there, he's saying, don't think that uh, this great victory over these uh, several hundred Muslims is just creditable to the British soldiers. This is God's victory over the infidels. It's uh, a, a scary kind of language that happened again and again when Christians came to Latin America and started wiping out the native peoples of Latin America. And of course, it's part of our own history in North America. When Christians came here and they called the native peoples here savages and, and uh, where there were orchestrated attempts uh, at, uh, at genocide and certainly at land theft. Um, uh, a Muslim writer on this subject, his name is uh, Reza Aslan, in a book he wrote called No God But God, he, he is uh, amazingly compassionate on uh, on Christians who struggle with these, uh, who, who have this ugly history in their past. Uh, th this uh, comes from 200, page 248 of his book. All great religions grapple with these issues, some more fiercely than others. One need only recall Europe's massively destructive Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648, between the forces of the Protestant Union and those of the Catholic League, to recognize the ferocity with which interreligious conflicts have been fought in Christian history. In many ways, the Thirty Years' War signaled the end of the Reformation, perhaps the classic argument over who gets to decide the future of a faith. What followed that awful war, during which nearly a third of the population of Germany perished, was a gradual progression in Christian theology from the doctrinal absolutism of the pre-Reformation era to the doctrinal pluralism of the early modern and ultimately the doctrinal relativism of the Enlightenment. This remarkable evolution of Christianity from its inception to its Reformation took 15 vicious, bloody, and occasionally apocalyptic centuries. And then he makes the comparison that Islam is going through a similar period. Now, my, my point in bringing this up is to say that we have in our history so much blood shed in the name of God that this third option to persecute and even exterminate the religious other is one that we have to take seriously. And we have to decide if we want to defend it, uh, if we want to perpetuate this approach, 
or if we want to find uh, another approach. So I said there were four common approaches. Convert, number one. Two, condemn and exclude. Number three, persecute. And then there's a fourth option, which is just to ignore, just to pretend they don't exist. Uh, and uh, uh, so for f there, there are roughly 33% of the world's 6.6 .6 billion people who uh, claim to be Christians of one sort or another. And so we can... Uh, we can just ignore the other 67% uh, and pretend they don't exist and just focus on our in-group. Those are four common responses to people of other religions. Uh, but when we especially focus on the people who do not want to convert to Christianity, and of course with all the condemning, excluding, persecuting, and ignoring going on, we shouldn't be surprised that people don't want to convert to Christianity. I'd like to suggest the fifth option. And that is that members of the church have a special call to love members of other religions. Now, you might say, well, yeah, that's obvious. That's what we knew you'd say. But I really want us to think about what it means to love a neighbor of another religion. And I want you to think about what that means for you as an individual Christian and what it would mean for your church community to understand itself as having a special role as being faithful to Jesus Christ in loving people of other religions. Uh, what does that mean? That, that could be a great topic for you to bring up with a small group and get them talking about it. Now, the first thing I would say is to love my neighbor of another religion does not preclude me sharing Christ with him or her. In fact, it requires me to share Christ with him or her, but not to do it from a perspective of, if you don't convert, then I'm going to condemn, exclude, persecute, or ignore you. Uh, but rather, I want to share Christ with you because... I love you, and I love Christ, and I think Christ has wonderful things to offer everyone that everyone needs, and I want to share that with you. So loving does not preclude sharing Christ. It requires sharing Christ. But it also requires loving the person, even if he or she doesn't really want to hear any more about Christ. Uh, it, it means treating them as a neighbor. It means treating them as the Good Samaritan, uh, treated the Jew in Jesus' radical story in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, it means, could I suggest, listening to them, learning about their religion, trying to understand it, not to fight with them about it, not to show what's inferior about it. Find out why they love it. Find out what's good in it. Really try to appreciate it. I had an uh, interesting experience a few months ago. I was in an airplane. Uh, no, nothing new for me. And uh, uh, I, it was one of those three seaters, and I was uh, near the window, and uh, in the aisle was uh, an Orthodox uh, Jew. Uh, he he uh, uh, was a, uh, uh, I don't know if he was Hasidic, but of some similar uh, commitment to the Hasidic Jews. He had a black hat and black, uh, black coat, uh, wore the tassels, and had the long, uh, ear, uh, uh, the, the long uh, ringlets in front of his ears. And, uh, uh, and then in between us sat this young woman, I'd say in her early 30s, who, uh, when I introduced myself to her, she introduced herself to me and then said, I'm a fundamentalist Christian. Uh, I am a religious right zealot. And uh, she said, I even live on a compound. <laughs> she said, I'm everything you can think of when you think of a religious right. I thought, this is going to be interesting. Well, what happened uh, over our plane ride is that uh, she uh, got to know me a little bit and then turned to, the, uh, to this Jewish fellow and she asked him about his religion. And she said, you know, I really don't know anything about Judaism except because I, I know I read the Old Testament and the Bible. She said, but I don't really know much about Judaism. And she said, I've never really met anybody like you before. Tell me about your faith. Tell me about your religion. So he started talking, and then he asked a little bit about hers. And, and over the course of about an hour and 45-minute flight, I got to witness two people deep in their own convictions, not at all interested in being converted by the other. But I got to listen to them show curiosity about each other's faith and respect each other, and be interested in each other. And it was so beautiful. When we got up at the end of the flight, uh, we each uh, said how much we enjoyed meeting each other. And uh, and this woman, who had identified herself, you know, as a fundamentalist Christian, she, 
she showed so much respect to this Jewish fellow and said, thank you, I'm so glad to meet you. And he said, well, thank you for your interest in my religion. He said, you know, a lot of times people just want to convert me, uh, but you have really shown interest in what I believe, and I really feel a lot of respect for me. It was, a, it was a beautiful moment, and I thought, here are people fulfilling that fifth option. Now, I personally believe that if we Christians were characterized by showing this kind of love toward members of other religions, uh, we would have an awful lot more of them saying, boy, I'm interested in learning more about Christ. Uh, and if we continue with the condemn, exclude, persecute, or ignore options, uh, we're not only going to see fewer and fewer people wanting to follow Christ, I think we're going to see an awful lot of people want to leave the church because they just don't want to be part of that kind of attitude. Well, I hope that gives you something to think about, and I hope today you'll keep your eyes open. Maybe you're going to meet someone today who's Muslim or who's Hindu or who's Jewish or Buddhist or uh or whatever. And I hope that your attitude toward them as a member of the church will be an attitude of interest and love and neighborliness. This is what the Apostle Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians 5 when he said that we are ambassadors for Christ. And ambassadors are people who come with a message of peace, not a message of conquest and war. Uh, we're coming as messengers of peace. And I hope that you'll bring the peace of Christ with you wherever you go today. In so doing, you'll be living out the role of the church in a beautiful way. Well, God bless you. This is Brian McLaren for wiredparish.com. Until next time. You've been listening to wiredparish.com. Visit us online for exclusive podcasts with some of the most challenging writers, thinkers, and speakers in the church. We bring you coffeehouse conversations with the best and the brightest. Tune in, turn on, get wired. wiredparish.com.